from San Francisco State University. She's the author of Smuggling Cherokee and Rabbit Stories. Kim's visual art has been included in shows both locally and abroad, such as the textile show at the National Museum of Taiwan in Taipei, and Art Women in California at the San Jose Art Museum. Welcome, Kim Shuck.
No matter how often her grandfather tossed the ball to her, she could never learn to ease off and wait for it. She would always catch it, but it was never pretty with that gentleness and ease that everyone else seemed to have. She'd lunge for it, grab for it, too eager, too excitable. She was the same at that, and although she was one of the better players, her swing made no sense. She chopped at the ball. And even more often than not, it would go sailing into the creek, but inelegantly. Well, it wasn't as if she could ever play in the pros. So how good did she need to be? The row of trophy statues stood neatly behind her grandmother's Elon sales awards. <laughs> <laughs> she woke up raining wet, smelling into the Osho. There was a song clinging to the corner of her mouth, and she was shivering. She toweled off and put on one of her grandfather's old t-shirts brewed a pot of coffee, mixed flour and baking powder and butter and water, cracked eggs into a bowl and added milk, cinnamon, took her great-grandmother's cast iron skillet down and laid thick cut bacon in neat rows and eventually stopped trembling. They need, they need us, pebbles shifting in shell. She ran her fingers through the bag of her hair, still supple, not getting dry at all, Called up a nature documentary on her computer screen and started to weep. From time to time, she went into the kitchen and ate something. Her family left her alone. She woke, she sang, ate, wove. The next door dogs mocked her on her way up to the house from the creek. Locusts chanting, the cat brought her a garden spider, black and green and still smelling of the lightning in that web. There was cribbage in the kitchen table, and there was rummy, there were crosswords, but she wove. She sang to the water, remailed some bottled tobacco, remembered watching her grandfather and her father, and she stood in that exact place and rolled a cigarette and smoked it. The blue tobacco moth pushed out of his cocoon in a second birth. He beat his wings and hummed to the river. The short hairs on his body ripple in the heat of the morning. We have to wait for them to dance. So this next piece is from my book, Rabbit Stories. Um, perhaps without explanation. <laughs> Chestnut Man drives Rabbit food to the airport. They whined through Islington, past trees just breaking, but it seems ungrateful to be going back to the city when this man had just finished making spring for her. She sighs. They know this drive too well, the curve around London. They pass St. Pancras, a Victorian confection that always reminds her of Moorish architecture. She presses her hand on his thigh, not ready to go, not ready to go. Feels like a small child, mutinous, resistant, but she has to be somewhere in a few days. They pass the bus of Jack Kennedy. She keeps meaning to look that story up and isn't sure why it's there. Rabbit food is greedy, greedy for these moments, for the narratives. She wants to know all the little spirits of this old place, how to be a good guest to them. She wants to be in London for warm weather someday. Warm weather in London being a myth that Chestnut Man shared with her. <laughs> days without an extra sweater, maybe even when her hair wouldn't frizz from the drizzle. There are museums, corners, parks to explore, and she's not done. She wants to wake up here with this man in the silence of his house to work in the press of the wild creativity. She wants to scream, so she sings very quietly, a small song of patience and tries to convince herself that she has some. Robin and Fox are agreed, this woman of rabbits is very polite. Rabbit shrugs. He's always seen her as a bit sharp, but he supposes that's not what they mean. A honeybee settles onto one of his ears and he starts in suspicion. She sits still and so does Rabbit. Things have started to come out to see him, drawn by Rabbit John. There are quiet things here, things built over. It's a good place for his thread spinner. She likes it here. It's beginning to like her. Small beings watch her leave this time, have become alert to her peregrinations. They take hold of her imagination as she watches. They tug at her. 
he's thinking about himself. It's so easy to fall for the city and wonders if she's packed fruit sherbets for him or maybe blackcurrant licorice. Rabbit doesn't want to go home either. Rabbit Food is reading about the Mary Celeste. She loves that there are unknown things. She likes cryptozoology texts, believes that gators and crocs are getting bigger, believes in giant squid. She sighs later in the book as they discuss Rona. There's no mention of her blue-eyed lumpy cousins on the mainland. Mystery, ha. Ah. She puts down the book and takes up some partial lace. She ties knots of unsolving of mysteries, of making simple the difficult, knots of renaming, knots against resistance to complicated explanations for the Ohio River Valley mounds. Between these, she ties knots of embracing the unknown, of the endless and vivid possibilities. Rabbit food dances knots in a clockwise direction and dreams.